Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 62. My name is Alina Warwick, and today we have Vien Chang on the show. But before we continue with this episode, I wanted to ask if you can share some love by subscribing to the podcast and leaving a rating. If you leave a rating, your name may be dropped in one of my future episodes. So stay tuned and connected. My great grandfather had actually left China in the late 1800 to be in the U.S. He actually came here and settled in Canada. But at the time, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, he couldn't really bring his family over. And because of that, he couldn't go back for some reason either. And so he, we've actually lost contact with my great grandfather. And it's been like on my bucket list since I don't know when to find what happened to him. But because of that, my grandmother on my mom's side had always been interested in being in the United States. Now separately, that's just one side. In fact, my mother was on the waiting list to move to this country for 15 years. By the time she got you know, the interview and, and the approval and everything. She had actually forgotten <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, about this process, but she was just super excited. Vian is originally from Hong Kong, China, and she came to the United States when she was very young. Her journey to the United States really started from her great-grandfather. Vian's great-grandfather had immigrated from China to the United States But because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, he was unable to bring any of his family members to the United States, and he couldn't leave the U.S. as well. Vian's journey includes the gold rush, and by the third generation, Vian's grandmother came to the United States, and then, after waiting for 15 years, her parents were allowed to come in. Vian is the founder of Vian Milano, which is a luxury hosiery brand dedicated to thigh-high stockings that are made in Italy. Founded in 2011, Vian transitioned her previous work in high-tech product management to designing, distributing, and managing a fashion e-commerce brand. Today, Vienne Milano has helped redefine thigh highs as a fashion category. Her collection of hosiery offers one of the world's most extensive variety for thigh high stockings consisting of classic styles, fashion forward pieces, skin tone matching shears, eco-friendly stockings, plus sizes, and much more. Vienne Milano has also been featured on Fox, New York Fashion Week, and Spark and Hustle by Tori of Good Morning America and has been a popular accessory for celebrities and magazines in photo shoots across the world. So let's dive right in and hear how Vienne launched her business, Zero Business Experience. Okay, Vian, thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm so honored to share your story. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. The honor is mine, to be honest. I look forward to speaking with you. So uh, let's talk about your immigrant journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to the United States? Sure. So I am originally from Hong Kong. I came here in the 1980s. All right. And how old were you when you immigrated to the United States? I was six years old. Six years old. Okay. So do you remember what it was like growing up in Hong Kong? Absolutely. You know, for some reason, I'm one of those weird people that have um, <laughs> like a very clear memory of my childhood. And I remember things very explicitly of Hong Kong. And so, yes, I do remember what it was like. And what was it like? So in Hong Kong at the time was the 80s, right? And so it was the beginning of the peak of the economy before <laughs> things started slowing down. And everyone was hustle and bustle, ultra competitive. Everybody was super focused on business and real estate and making buck, a uh, quick buck. Mm-hmm. And so when I moved to the United States, perhaps it's because of where I moved to, it was very different. It was like night and day. Well, I'm assuming you moved with your parents. That's right. Yes. And why did they choose United States? Did they have any family or friends out here? 
you know, I knew that we were going to get to this question and I'm like, I don't know if I <laughs> want to give you the long story or the short story, but I'm going to, just because I know we have a little bit of time, I'll give you the long story. Okay. Yeah. No problem. So the long story is my great grandfather had actually left China in the late 1800 to be in the U.S. He actually came here and settled in Canada. But at the time, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, he couldn't really bring his family over. And because of that, he couldn't go back for some reason either. And so he, we've actually lost contact with my great grandfather. And it's been like on my bucket list since I don't know when to find what happened to him. But because of that, my grandmother on my mom's side had always been interested in being in the United States. Now separately, that's just one side. Separately, over a hundred years ago, I would say there was a separate family they're the Yi family. And there was a man who came to the United States because of the gold rush. He settled in San Francisco. And again, because of the Chinese occlusion that he couldn't bring his family over. And so for three generations, what this man would do is he would have his child in China. And then when the child was old enough, bring the child over to the United States. And then when that child is older, he would go back to China to get married, et cetera, et cetera, like repeating this for three generations. And by the third generation, that man married my aunt, who is my mom's older sister. So through that, my mom's older sister, my aunt, she brought my grandmother over. Everybody came in legally. So, you know, they had actually documented us or registered my mother, Mm -hmm. the U.S. government. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. There's always like a long process and long interview. In fact, my mother was on the waiting list to move to this country for 15 years. By the time she got, you know, the interview and and the approval and everything, she had actually forgotten (laughs) um, (laughs) uh, about this process, but she was just super excited. And so long story short, we came to the United States because of my family on my mother's side. It's so interesting to hear how people come here and through the different processes. And I got to say, yours beats everyone so far. <laughs> there's the <laughs> gold rush. There's the Chinese Exclusion Act. There's... A uh, little bit of people, everything, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Moving back to China, having kids coming back, going back and forth. Wow. I mean, the things that, you know, our ancestors have done to bring us here is just so astonishing to hear. And we got to truly be grateful for us coming here on an easier term than others in the past. So, wow, what an amazing story. Okay. It's true. You know, it's interesting that you say on an easier term, because by the time it was our turn, all my parents and I had to do was just get on a plane, or at least for me. I mean, my parents had to go through an interview process as well. But for me, it was just, okay, pack up, here's your doll, get on a plane and fly over. So it was an easier process for me. But nevertheless, as I'm a little older now, I cannot take for granted all the, the, my, my predecessors and my ancestors had to go through. Right, right. And even waiting for 15 years, that's still a long time too. But wow, thank you so much to all of our parents for going through the processes, <laughs> right? Absolutely. <laughs> so they joined, I'm assuming they joined your aunt and her family here? Yes, that's right. And that's actually another part. So, you know, originally, because the E family was in the West Coast, it's actually through indentured servantry that this man and his family gradually moved to the East Coast and we settled in Brookline, Massachusetts. So yes, we all lived there for many years. In fact, my aunt still lives there. Okay. And did your parents know any English? They did to some degree because Hong Kong was a colonial city. So a small amount of English was taught. However, English in the UK, for example, is just a little different. You know, there are things that are just different. So there was still a learning curve for all of us. Mm -hmm. And how did they manage to find jobs? Was it an easier transition for them? Yes and no. So my dad in Hong Kong, his profession was, he was an engineer. So what he focused on mainly was 
working with cars that were imported to Hong Kong from America. And he would be the engineer that would design or work on switching from, you know, driving from the left side to the right side, because in Hong Kong, similar to the UK, we drive on the, the other side of the road. But when he moved to America, this job is like, not it doesn't obsolete. exist right obsolete <laughs> because cars are made here and if they're imported they're switched already and so he did work on freelance or he worked on cars and auto mechanics as a role for a little bit but eventually he started his own business and then he had his own business fixing cars whereas my mother she had always been in the import export business working with like cargo shipments and stuff but at the time she worked in Hong Kong so it was always ocean export. So when she moved to the US, it took her some time, but she eventually did find a job in that specific role, but it would be ocean import because now we're importing things Mm -hmm. from Asia or from whatever. But before she got there, both my parents had dabbled a little bit in, you know, working in Chinese restaurants and waitering and waitressing. I'll never forget like the time when they like saved their first paycheck and bought like a Sony recorder for me just because I was an only child at the time. And I was You know, I didn't have any friends because I didn't speak English. So they bought something for me so that I could play with at home. Aww, that's so nice of them. And do you remember if you guys were on any government assistances? No. No? Oh, that's Uh -uh. good. That's really Uh good. So um, you were six years old when you immigrated. Do you recall having any struggles either in school or anywhere else? You know, it's funny because the only struggle I think that I dealt with was language and food, right? Because as anybody <laughs> can explain, food from other cultures, even even if you're from Europe, is very different, right? And so yeah. it took all of us some time to get used to, but language, I think, was one. Honestly, school was quite easy because I think anywhere overseas, school is different. Right? Oh, yes. I, I honestly Absolutely. felt like... Yeah, I, I honestly felt like I slept through it all. <laughs> I felt like the fifth grade, you know, when, you know, things started catching up. But the only extracurricular activity that I did to catch up with everything was, you know, I had to take extra reading classes that were provided by our school. While I was in ESL program, which is short for English as a second language. But I think my mom at some point, I think by the time I was in the third or fourth grade, she realized, you know what, I think she can play and communicate with other students. So she quickly grabbed me out of that program so that I would be really fully immersed into English language. But those were really the two areas that I could describe were struggles. Other things were just more cultural shock. And those are things that you learn gradually. Yeah. Right. And did you know English before you were dropped off at school? Kind of, not really. I knew, you know, the alphabet. And, you know, I think I had in my mind that I would introduce myself like, hello, my name is Hello Kitty. <laughs> but <laughs> never really had the, like, the guts to, to say that. But I knew a very minimal amount of English. Okay. Yeah. Just like a lot of other people too. And, and me too, when I was four years old, but we didn't speak any English at the house at all. It was all just strictly Russian. And we were dropped off at grade school. And it's like, all right, go figure it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you guys still speak Russian at home with your parents? Or? So yeah, so my dad, since he has his own business for several years, I speak to him in English most of the time. But with my mom, it's just Russian. And when I speak Russian, it's a lot of different English words grabbed in yeah. there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I can speak fluently. I can read. I can write with lots of uh, misspelling, but I can get by. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in Hong Kong, what age do kids go to school? Is it five, six years old or is it much younger than that? Younger. Younger. So I I would say, I mean, there's preschool, right? And you get tested into school at the age of two. And so you- Two years old. Yeah, there's rigorous testing at two, and then you get tested for elementary school at five. And then you go on your very way. (laughs) There's a lot of standardized testing. Let's just put it that way. So at two years old, you get tested and, and then you get placed into school? Yep. And then you get, you test again to get into elementary school. Wow. Yeah. So two years old, is that like 
pre-K or what do they call it? BB class. I, I don't, this is a rough translation. Yeah. BBI, which is a BB, baby class, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. I love it. And I, it's funny because I remember some of the, uh, the tests. I mean, this is probably not the first, like I, the, my memory from the first test is not there, but the second one, I remember like I had to rehearse so that when I was tested, I would know to tell a story about a mouse that ate too much and couldn't climb out of his bowl, you know, <laughs> you know but it was, it was very simple storytelling and reading and math tests that were given at the age of five. Oh, I love it. Oh my goodness. Wow. So Vian, before you tell our listeners about your company, tell me a little bit more about the path you took. So I know you were in corporate America for a little time. Mm -hmm. um, what was the journey like? And did you go into any other fields before starting your business, Vian Milano? Sure. Yeah. This is yet another one of those. Oh my God, I hope I have enough time for this. But, um, you will. <laughs> essentially, you know, I knew at an early age, actually, even when I was in Hong Kong, I loved to drive kind of a creative person, I guess. And when I was in college, I studied at, this is the un-immigrant part. Like my parents did not force me to go into accounting or become a doctor um, or a lawyer. However, I felt like because I was majoring in fine arts and I was majoring in psychology, I there was a part of me that I felt like I needed to work extra hard, right? To kind of catch up. And I don't know who I was catching up with or whatever. <laughs> but mm -hmm. because of that feeling in college, I actually worked and studied full time. So I graduated ahead of time. I graduated out of college three years instead of four. And then by that time, I had a lot of I guess, items in my portfolio, I mainly focused on graphic design. And so I had a huge portfolio of graphic design. What did you graduate in? My degree is in fine arts and fine psychology. Arts. Yeah. But I mainly focused on, you know, learning Photoshop and doing graphic design work. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated, I had a, a pretty strong um, portfolio of graphic design work that I was able to find a job as a creative director for a dot-com company. This was in like the late 90s, early 2000s, right? And the bubble had just burst. <laughs> and so, yeah. But I knew I wanted to be in the technology field. And so I worked in a small dot-com company and I thought, wow, this is great. However, it exposed me to business and I thought I really would like to learn more about business. And so I decided shortly after that to go into business school. And so I got my MBA and I had also switched careers from graphic design to marketing and then to project management. And eventually I was in corporate America, worked at Akamai Technologies and worked there. I, I liked it. However, I just didn't know if I could be in this field forever. I didn't see myself like, hey, looking back when I was 70 years old thinking, yeah, I you know, didn't project manager for this dot-com company. And why, um, why was that? Because I don't think that was what I really liked to do. You know, I knew that I was a creative person and I had always wanted to start a business. There's another story behind it too. I mean, <laughs> around that time, I had met a woman who left her corporate job to become like a mountain climber. She's the first woman to climb all seven summits of the world. And wow. she had said, you know, when I turned 70, I wanted to look back and say <laughs> that, that my goal or, or what I achieved was to climb. I'm like, oh my God, that's really ambitious. I mm -hmm. would never have this goal of I? <laughs> I can't even <laughs> climb one mountain. Well, no, I can hike, but like, you know, I was inspired by her ambition. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, gosh, wouldn't that be nice to, you know, look back in my 70s and say, this is what I started, this is what I created. And so that was really the aspiration behind it all. So how long were you in corporate America when you decided to venture off and create your own company? Well, I worked in corporate America in total, I would say almost 10 years but at Akamai, that would be the biggest company that I worked for in my career. I think it was five, six years. So I can't say I'm somebody who left, you know, 30 years of corporate America and then decided to venture off on my own. I, it was a relatively short period 
almost 10 years in total. What was that journey like for you? Did you wake up and said, that's it, too much overtime, I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to go find a new company to create? Or did you start a side hustle on the side to see if it's going to work and pan out and then quit your job? So what was that journey like for you? Sure. Well, I think this might be an ongoing theme with a lot of immigrants that you've interviewed too much overtime, it does not exist in our vocabulary. <laughs> so that was definitely not the reason. In fact, I think m- most of us who leave corporate America, we know that we're going into a career that will require even more work, right? right, um, right. But the reason why I started Via Milano was because I couldn't find thigh high stockings that would stay up on my leg. It was a more foo foo y reason. <laughs> They didn't stay up on my leg or the stockings that I found didn't stay up on my leg, not because I'm like very thin or whatever, but because they were just not well made. At the time, found stockings that were either meant for Halloween or the really nice stockings were very, very expensive, too expensive for me to afford to wear to work every day. And so as somebody who did travel to Europe quite often. I knew that this style of hosiery existed in Europe, uh, especially in Italy. And so I worked for nine months building and sourcing. I, I would take time off to visit Italy and to meet with suppliers. But at the same time, I had also drew like a line on the sand or whatever the uh, idiom is and Mm -hmm. said, I am going to leave corporate America on this day and to launch my business on this day. And so, you know, I did not want this to be a side hustle. You know, all of the side hustle I did prior to it was really to research and to get my ducks aligned. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go into this business fully. So you kind of started on the side while still working your nine to five job, right? Kind of. You know, the business hadn't launched yet prior to me leaving Akamai. So what I'm hearing is you found a problem in your day-to-day life and there was no solution because the other thigh-high stockings did not stand up on your thighs and your legs. So you decided to find a solution. And what did you do first? Did you go to Google? Did you start calling a bunch of friends to see how to start a company? What did you do first? And and I'm assuming you didn't have any other business experience. So I'm really interested to know what were your steps? You're right. I didn't have relevant experience. I had ventured a little bit into starting a photo studio, but experience from that is not really relevant to this business. But how did I get started? Well, a combination of things. I had actually met my business partner randomly at an event But aside from that, I also, you know, spent a decent amount of time on Google, just Googling what is out there, how often is this product searched for, I don't remember the number anymore. And also, I spent some time visiting department stores and stores that sold thigh-high stockings, which are actually called hold-ups or stay-ups in the UK, so that might be an easier term to use. And I, I just took a lot of notes on what was available, what was available in terms of size, what the price point was. So I did a lot of that. I also spent a number of months or two or three months in Italy, not all together, but like combined in Northern Italy, sourcing, meeting suppliers, going back to see what they were coming up with. And then I went there quite often and and to really get re-familiarized with the culture. I had visited Italy when I was 15 as part of choir. And I thought, oh gosh, I know a little bit about the culture. But I think to fully know a culture, you really have to spend a lot of time in there. And I think that was part of the learning curve as well, just working with a culture of folks that are quite different from where I'm originally from. And that's also quite different for where I grew up. And how did you find these suppliers in Italy? Research. Really, you pick up a telephone book and you, you know, (laughs) you look at, okay, who's available? You know, you look at the website. For me, it was really important to visit the suppliers. And the reason is because you never know what you're getting into, right? It could be that they exist near a farm and a stinky farm at that, you know, will this stink impact your hosiery? (laughs) 
are the suppliers reliable? You have to look at somebody right in the eye to see, okay, what is going on <laughs> in this person's face? <laughs> is this person accountable, etc. So for me, building that relationship at the very beginning was important. Got it, got it. And how old were you when you started a VN Milano? I was 30 years old. So, 30 years old. Yeah, that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to start or leave corporate America. It was like a, a little gift for myself to do that as a 30th birthday present to myself. Okay. And so when you quit, you all of a sudden had no stable income coming in. So did you have any savings before you launched? I did. I did. Just a little bit. Yeah. So it was enough to get me my... <laughs> Was that scary for you to, you know, leave a cushiony, stable job to all of a sudden take a huge risk and start VN Milano and having absolutely no idea if this is going to work or what's going to happen with it? Was it scary at all for you? It was, but I wouldn't say like I was somebody who who had cold feet. Like I, for up, leading up to this point, I had wanted to to do something that was what I wanted to do right and so I just knew that this was the thing that I need to do and that I believe if there's a will then there's a way for it and so I didn't really think about okay how much money I will not be making at the you know just how lucrative my salary was you know but I just kept thinking the potential of what I could be making and the potential of all the other things that I would be building that's what I focus more on what retail stores are your hosiery items listed in and where do people buy these products sure so we started our focusing on e-commerce. And the reason for that was because most women or men, when they buy stockings, they don't, you know, try it out at a store, right? And so they mainly buy it, take it home and try it out. So because of that, I wanted to stick with the online model. And to buy our stockings, you can reach us at vnmilano.com. I mean, there are a few stores here and there throughout the U.S. that you can find our product, but for the most part, you can find our entire full collection online. And what about the design? I am looking at pictures online. Wow, beautiful design. So intricate details on them. Who designs them? Is it just all ran through you? Yes, it's me, but I can't take credit for all of it. So in our collection, there's two things. And then this is the funny part, you know, because I worked in corporate America, I left product management. A lot of my Jargons are the vocabulary that I use continue to be uh, focused on products, right? And so um, I often say, you know, we have a product portfolio that's divided into two groups. So one group is called a permanent collection. And these are the classic items like your black shears, fishnet stockings, you know, pig black stockings, etc. that I cannot take credit for. These have been items that have been around for a long time. However, we have also something called a signature collection, which are products that are more fashion forward. So we have, for example, things that are made with Italian tool that are handcrafted. We have items that features very fashion for colors like neon, a fluorescent yellow, fluorescent green. Those are colors that we've incorporated for a limited time only. And then there are also patterns and designs that are only available for a limited time in our signature collection. So those are really the areas that I focus on and design. Wow, so interesting. I love your business model. And Vian, how long did it take your business to start seeing some real traction? So you did about, you said, nine months of research. And then mm -hmm. did you launch after that? And did you start seeing customers buying your products at your first day launch? Or how did that work for you? Yeah, so, you know, we launched in November. You know, we decided to launch the business with a bang, with a fashion show at the Intercontinental. And so we did that not knowing anything about seasonalities and, well, I mean, I guess consumer behavior as well when it comes to buying hosiery. But I would say that traction started picking up in February when our product was picked up by the Daily Gromit, which I think still exists today. And, you know, they wanted to feature our independent business, and, you know, they made a little video about our, our stockings 
And that was when we started seeing like, wow, there's a lot of women out there who really want to try this product out. But it was also a good test to see, okay, what are some styles and sizes that women were interested in the most? So you said it just took a couple of months from November to, you said January, and then that's yeah. when you start seeing the sales come through? Mm-hmm. This is kind of a interesting question because between November and January, it wasn't, you know, nothing going on. I think because I am somebody who grew up in Boston, you know, friends started telling friends and a lot of my coworkers or former coworkers had wanted to support my business. So in the beginning, there were traction already through word of mouth, through friends and through the community that I was part of. But I think we started seeing like, I don't want to say random people, but like people I did not know (laughs) buying our product, you know, in February. Mm. Did you start doing any advertising in the beginning stages to get the word out there? Or what was your marketing strategy like? In the beginning, we did not actually spend much money on search engine marketing and all that. For the most part, we spent a lot of time with social media, Facebook at the time. I mean, I guess it still is the dominant social media platform in the US. So we spent a lot of time you know, just posting and promoting our products online. We did do a little bit of events. We we held, hosted a few events here and there. We also hired and worked with promoters whom, you know, would be ambassadors for the brand and would pass out our cards here and there. So Mm -hmm. we spent some time on working with word of mouth marketing. And so when you said that you only focused on e-commerce, did you have to source the inventory, your house or your apartment, or was this really coming from directly from Italy to Mm -hmm. the American customers via drop shipment? Or what was that process like? Nope. In the beginning, you know, I knew that I wanted to work with a supplier who can ship and pack for us. And so mainly because I'm not a very organized person, I'm more of a creative. (laughs) person. And so from the get-go, we, you know, had designed a collection of 40 different styles, had, you know, had purchased, I don't, I want to say three ton worth of stockings. And we also had found a distributor that was 45 minutes south of where I lived so that we can ship this three ton of hosiery to the fulfillment center. I and my business partner and a friend would count everything and they would do the shipping and packing for us. So that was something that we had wanted to do from the very beginning. That said, there are some things that you learn from that experience, which is there are suppliers who may damage things. So, you know, a number of our items were damaged in the beginning. And so I took the damaged products home to my office, home office, And so those are the items that we would use to give to models, samples, et cetera. So I did have a home office set up, but, you know, even to this day, we continue to import stockings from Italy and bring it into the United States where we would fulfill here in the U.S. I love it. Yeah, it's so good to notate that you really honed in on your creative side instead of doing everything all by yourself and advertising and creating a website and launching it and also creative and shipping and packing and inventory count. Oh my goodness, that would be such a crazy time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite a, you know, bit to learn, right? I think that's okay. You know, I I don't think Besides, you know, Sarah Blakely of Spanx, there aren't many women that, or men, that I've met whom have started a hosiery business, right? And so, or started the hosiery business and grew it. And so, you know, for me, I knew that this wasn't something I could pick up a book and read. This isn't something that I could, you know, be an apprentice of. This is something that you have to learn right on the spot. And did you have to raise any capital to start your business? So I know you had initially some savings, but did the savings last? Did you have to raise capital? The savings is last. And my business partner also, you know, he had put his investment into it as well. But there is another component, though, that is related to this. So being in the business for a few years, we decided actually to 
used to do a, not Kickstarter, to do a crowdfunding campaign. And so the campaign was a good way for us to not only promote the brand, but to talk with our customers. And the reason why we did this was because, you know, for a number of years, we had products and people would continue, customer-wise, would continue to say, hey, I would really like this product in red. I would really like this product in whatever fashion color. And Uh you bring it and you're like, gosh, what am I, what are we doing wrong? (laughs) You know, we listen to our customer, but some of these products that people are asking for are flying off the shelf. So a Kickstarter campaign was a good way for us to hone in and to see, okay, I know you're really interested in red stockings, but are you willing to put some money up front? Exactly. And that we will deliver this to you, you know, a couple months down the line. And so it was also a good way to see if our customers wanted to see our products with our, our box. So part of our brand in the very beginning was to launch a fabulous pair of stockings and a fabulous box. So we have this purple gift box that slide out and people were very impressed by this box, right? But at the same time, we were also receiving inquiries from customers like, hey, I already have 10 of your boxes. I'm going to buy 10 more pairs of your stockings. You don't need to give me the box. And so the crowdfunding campaign that we did on Indiegogo was a good way for us to see do, do our customers want the box or are they willing to pay for it, etc. And it turns out only 50% of our customers were interested in receiving that gift box. So today we do offer the box, but you have to pay a little bit more for it just because I know people, you know, want to use the box as a, as a way to present our hosiery to their lover, to their friend or mother or whomever it may be, or to themselves. That's awesome that you were able to pivot your your business model to deliver the actual items that people are going to and willing to pay, and especially having the option for the gift box to be an option, not a mandatory thing that you guys would always send out at every single purchase. So that's great to hear. Vian, I wanted to know if you had any mentors that helped you out to start your business. So I'm hearing that you had a business partner. Where did you find the business partner? And did you have any other mentors? So my business partner is my mentor. And how did I meet him? Well, really randomly, like I said, prior to leaving Akamai and starting DM Milano, I had wanted to do something different with my life. And I had gone to various events to, I mean, I was a lot younger and (laughs) um, more social at the time. And so I randomly it was invited to a European in Boston event and I randomly met my business partner. And, but that's definitely one thing that I would encourage entrepreneurs to do, which is to meet as many people as possible. And I know it's hard, especially with COVID, but the thing with the pandemic is that I think right now, even though you're not randomly meeting people, you are given a chance to get to know people on a deeper level, on a more meaningful level, because you can have conversations like we are now and really get to have those one-on-one better than going to a party or an event where you may or may not meet that person that may be beneficial to you. Mm, So I'm hearing networking Mm -hmm. and getting connected and building those relationships is important in the entrepreneur life. Yes, at least for me, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So Vienna, how do you stay productive throughout the days? Um, I hear in the background, there's kids. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes. I, no, I a, no, that's totally fine. And I, 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 I love it. I love it. And that's why I want to ask, how do mothers and business owners who have kids stay productive? I'm super interested to know. Well, you, you get help. <laughs> but also, well, in the I mean, my son is going to turn one tomorrow, but in the beginning, it, it took some time to get adjusted. There was a good period where I had been very militant about nap time, right? So he has to take his nap at 10 and 2. But now, I, as I'm learning when babies turn, I guess, 1, that morning nap disappears. And so we just have to find other ways to keep them occupied. Both my husband and I work at home. And so we have a little bit of flexibility and our parents are are close by. And so, again, we have some help as well, but it's really focusing. I mean, there's a number of 
nights where my husband, after we put our son to sleep after dinner, we go right back to our desk and start working. Mm. And does your husband help out with the business or does he do something different? He he does something different. But I mean, you know, I think one thing that entrepreneurs or, or a lot of books and stuff they don't mention is that when you start your own business, there's a lot of like moving boxes. There's a lot of physical work that you have, laborious <laughs> work you yeah. have to do. And my husband is definitely has helped me a number of times to, to move equipment here and there. You know? <laughs> and he's a yeah. he's my driver as well. I mean, I drive, but you know, <laughs> he, he does help us in that way, moving and driving. <laughs> So have you brought your baby to meetings and events with you? Not to events, but he has come into the office a few times. We try our, I mean, the door is closed, but you know, there's a number of times when he makes his presence known by yelling and screaming. But then there are a number of calls where I am on where the folks on the other end is like, oh my God, just bring your baby. I want to see him. So and I, he has met folks virtually. Mm-hmm. Not that he'll remember. You know, he does appear every so often. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Hopefully he'll appear in some of the marketing and, and Facebook ads or whatever you guys are doing to, <laughs> to to draw some unique attention to your hosiery items. That would be super awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Vienna, I wanted to switch gears and talk about mistakes or failures because I know there's always a story behind mm-hmm. the mistakes we make. Are there any mistakes or failures you'd like to share with us where you saw a positive shift after implementing new things? Yeah, I mean, I, I there's a couple of things I can share, but I think the one that I go back on quite often is the fact that when we first launched, we had launched 40 items. A number of them were colorful products. All, when I say colorful, there were really a lot of in the shades of purple, they're like, that's one of my favorite colors. And, you know, when we first launched, the supplier that we worked with in Italy had said, hey, if you're launching this business in Italy, American women only buy black stockings. So you may want to just focus on black stockings. And I thought, how could that possibly be? I consider myself, even though an immigrant, I consider myself an American and I love colors. Yeah. And so I said, no, I'm, we're going to bring all these colors to our collection. And at the end of the day, you know, our supplier wasn't wrong. Black, even to this day, is our bestseller. You know, people might look up red stockings and they may find us, but they check out with black stockings. And so wow. that's one of the reasons why we decided to split our collections into the permanent and signature collection, where our permanent collection is mainly black stockings. And our signature collection is, you know, a mix of various colors and, and so forth. Neon green and neon exactly. yellow and exactly. hot pink and purple. Yep. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay. So you just, you just basically split the collections, but you still offer those wild and crazy colors. Yes. At a limited collection or a limited quantity. That said though, if we do see something that is very popular, you know, we'll we'll have that item stick around a little longer by pr- producing more of it. But you know, the key learning thing here is colors can impact business. You know, some colors mm-hmm. are more lucrative than others. And so, Vienna, I wanted to ask you, what makes your company set apart from your competitors? Sure. So there aren't many stockings companies that just focus on thigh high stockings. I think there are a number of hosiery businesses out in the world, but a lot of them, they offer, you know, pantyhose or just socks. Um, We just focus on thigh high stockings. And what makes us special is the fact that our stockings feature a silicone band at the very top. And Whereas some of our competitors, they use rubber band. So those, mm. they don't last, they're uncomfortable. Some people make thigh-high stockings that aren't actually thigh-high stockings. They are actually over-the-knee stockings. So ours come all the way up to the very top so that, you know, when worn properly, they stay up and they're, mm-hmm. you know, they are just quite comfortable to wear. Um, for us, you know, one of the things that I had worked on when we first launched the business is on the brand positioning. And even to this day, I stick by it, which is Via Milano reveals the style and confidence of a woman who knows how to be elegant, playful, and sexy in every occasion. And mm. we choose all of those words because I want it to play up 
on the elegance of thigh high stockings and play down the perception that thigh high stockings is a sexy brown. I'm not saying they're not sexy. They are absolutely sexy, but I wanted to play up the fact that, you know, this is a fashion accessory that could be worn for every occasion and that can be worn elegantly as well. Yeah. And and not just a lingerie brand. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And that's why when you go to our website, you, you'll see a section there for to shop by occasion. You know, we really want to encourage the idea that you can wear this for work, to go to a party, like a wedding. You can obviously wear it for a hot date, but you can also wear it as what we call play, which is, you know, when you're out, you know, hanging out with your friends on a girl's night out, etc. I love the fact that you guys honed in on what you guys did best and stuck with it and stuck with your amazing business model. So Vian, what does the American dream mean to you? This is a very good question. I mean, I think this (laughs) country continues to be one of the freest country. You know, I think my business partner who is Italian would say that to start a business like this in Italy or in Europe, you would have to climb a number of obstacles. You know, there are or more things you have to do. And so I think for me, the American dream is to be able to start my own business, to be fully independent, right? And yes, you can arguably do that in other countries, but I think it's a a little bit easier still to do so in America. And when I say freely independently, I mean, you know, to, to speak your mind, to to go out without asking for permission. You know, a woman can drive here, you know. (laughs) I can go out whenever I want. But at the same time, though, with that freedom, you, you, it comes with the responsibility too. When you do all of those things here, you have to be mindful of the responsibility that you have to take with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how we can always embrace the fact that this country is really full of opportunities and we just have to be able to bring that hard work like you Uh did and be able to do the research if we need to get out there, get connected, because it is possible to create the dream job, to create the dream life here in America. Whereas in other countries, like your business partner said, it would be so, so difficult and sometimes clearly impossible. So it's good to notate that, hey, immigrants, we are here in America and no one cares about a broken English accent or what you look Uh like or where you're from. Get out there, get connected, get inspired by all of these stories because you can do it as well. So Bian, what are some things you would advise the next aspiring immigrant that wants to start their own business? To just do it. I think there's no better time than now to start your own business. There's a billion excuses in the world, but I think it's really up to you to start that business and to do it now. I love it. So Vian, thank you is so, so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I absolutely love to share self-taught stories like yourself. Zero experience, zero business experience, no experience in the hosiery line at all, but you went out there, you met suppliers, you did your research, you got connected. And look at that. Many years later, you're still thriving. And I absolutely love to share your story. And thank you so much. Truly an honor. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my story. Can't wait for this to be published. No worries. Thank you so much. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a review wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.